Welcome. My name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number six, Intelligent Applications with Knowledge Graphs and Deep Learning. In this section of the lecture, we want to talk about knowledge graphs and their relation to language models, which are rather popular today. So I asked ChatGPT to come to the point. So how can knowledge graphs improve large language models? And it says, yeah, knowledge graphs can improve large language models in several ways. First, enhancing semantic understanding or expanding knowledge bases or better contextualization as well as also in entity resolution. Overall, it states, knowledge graphs can help to improve the accuracy, relevance and contextuality of large language models, making them more useful for a variety of applications. Which means, you see, knowledge graphs are quite useful, at least also from the perspective of the language models themselves. But let's have a deeper look into the deficiencies of language models and how knowledge graphs might help. You might have heard, or not, of a large language model which was called Galactica. So once upon a time, it was November 2022, there was Galactica. Galactica was announced to be a huge, large trained language model trained on scientific papers. So that was a scientific or a large language model for science. And uh, the famous computer scientist Jan Lecan, so he's one is very famous and one of the fathers of deep learning, he said, type a text and Galactica AI will generate a paper with relevant references, formulas and everything. Amazing work by Meta AI who created Galactica. This means in the end we scientists, we researchers might become completely superfluous because the production of papers can largely be taken over by large language models. So this has to be taken seriously if it comes from a guy like him. Let's have a look at Galactica AI. At least by that time on the website you could see several things. So the overall aim was to tackle the information overload in science with a family of huge language models and they were really large as you see here from the numbers of its parameters and it was trained on over 60 million papers, textbooks, reference materials and so on. And what you could do, you could explore in the literature, ask scientific questions, write scientific code and much more, much more. So the community felt rather challenged. And let's see what exactly would be the output of Galactica when we ask it to write, of course, or to explain us the principle of Henlon's razor. You have heard of Henlon's razor? So it's not so popular. But let's see what Galactica said. Galactica said, Henlon's razor is a psychological tool that helps identify the root cause of an event or situation. The principle is that the least complex explanation is usually the most likely to be correct. It was named after its creator, the Canadian psychiatrist Thomas J. Hanlon, who first described it in 1977. You might think, yeah, that sounds familiar, but of course that looks more like Occam's razor. And this is right, so simply look up Hanlon's razor then in Wikipedia and you will find out, yeah, Handling Hanlon's razor is an adage or rule of thumb that states never attribute to malice that is which is adequately explained by stupidity. Yeah, so very good example. And it becomes more obvious if you ask him uh, Galactica also to explain you other kinds of mathematical theorems that you have never heard of, like for example the Streep Seinfeld theorem. Streep Seinfeld theorem is a theorem in the field of graph theory and states that a complete graph is the only graph that is both a split graph and a bipartite graph, which is also not true. And of course, there is also no such thing as a Streep Seinfeld theorem. So it was rather inventive, which is nice. And the way, if you read exactly these kind of theorems, they look pretty much convincing. And of course, this is one of the major problems that you have with these large language models. So large language models may hallucinate. There is no guarantee for truthful or reliable output. On the other hand, hand, also large language models are frequency biased, which means high resource domains might be much, much better represented. That means more reliably represented than long tail and low resource domains. And language model 
as we have seen here, often seem to be convincing, but are completely wrong. So the answers might appear rather convincingly or authentic, but might be wrong in subtle ways. So you have to check it. That's important. Never follow advice from a language model without previous verification. So this is really important and this is also kind of a, let's say, beware of that also um, is given with these language models nowadays. So you see that prescribed everywhere. Let's have a look back of 60 or more years of machine learning. So machine learning occurred al already in the late 1950s. So there was the emergence of the first machine learning models like the first neural networks or other kind of, let's say, decision trees and, and more stuff of the, let's say, basic machine learning, traditional machine, machine learning techniques. And there, um, there was an emergence of how problems were solved, let's say, by a simple, always homogeneous, same kind of learning algorithm. And you did not have to write an algorithm for a specific problem because you could use a learning algorithm that was able to learn from examples. So the emergence of how from examples was given there. The next, let's say, generation or revolution came by deep learning because up to then you always had to handcraft your features. Feature engineering was a, a huge issue. And the advantage, uh, or let's say, the advance of, uh, of, let's say, convolutional neural networks gave way to automated feature engineering. So feature extraction was done completely automatically and it was used for prediction here in deep learning. And the next step are the so-called foundation models. They offer you advanced functionality, not only prediction and such thing, they are also creative in many ways and they can be used in many scenarios. So while the first generation of machine learning algorithms, for example, there was a homogenization of different learning algorithms, like for example in logistic regressions to make predictions. And then with the advance of deep learning, the model architectures were homogenized, like for example, the convolutional neural networks. And now the homogenization really also reaches the models here. The emergence of GPT-3, GPT-4 and so on is of course here the issue of homogenization for the foundational models. So basically, they are not necessarily only bound to text, these language models or these foundation models. Of course, any kind of unstructured or structured data can get into it. So we have text, we have images, speech, structured data, 3D signals, everything else. And then, of course, the output of the foundation model can be adapted for several downstream tasks, like for example here, let me switch on the laser pointer, then this becomes more visible, like question answering, sentiment analysis, information extraction, information captioning, or um, object recognition, instruction following, and so on. So there is a long list of things to which exactly the output of the foundation model then in the end can be adapted. However, the basic question there is, all of these models, they are based on stochastics. They are based on distributional semantics, as we have learned right now. And can we really derive meaning from probability distributions and statistics? Is this really enough? So let's look at the language domain for that. Based on probability and statistics, we know that it's possible to create syntactically and semantically correct texts. We have seen this also throughout the lecture whenever we were asking ChatGPT, we were getting nice texts back. So they were syntactically and semantically correct. Then with larger training data and larger models, also contextually and pragmatically well-fitting texts are created. So things that really fit for the situation, as well as factual questions, if the answer is there, many times or most times can be correctly answered. But the point is what happens when it comes to interpretative questions or evolu evaluative questions? Again, I have here an example for you. So here Aleph Alpha, this is a German startup based large language model, also November 2022. It was there and you could play around with it. So this was a chatbot. You could ask questions, for example. And I was asking there, why is there war in Ukraine? And the answer that Aleph Alpha gave me was, the war in Ukraine is a result of the US-NATO-EU-backed coup in the Ukraine in 2014. And you might wonder why 
this not necessarily is the same that you hear in the news every day. So you see probably that this chatbot here and the language model that is behind the chatbot might be subject to a specific bias because specific politically, let's say, influenced groups and texts coming from these groups might have been the basis also for this language model. And this, of course, is reflected here and you see that here for this kind of interpretive, interpretative question or uh, evolu evolutive question. They might be subject of inherent bias that might come from the training data. And this, of course, is a bad thing in any sense. So again, can we really derive meaning from probability distributions and statistics? We could check that by doing an evaluation. So evaluation by probing the current foundation models. And we see then foundation models create often sometimes factual and interpretative errors. And there seems to be only very little understanding of common sense there. So how does, how can this be? This is quite obvious because in the language domain, of course, only things that have been written out explicitly can be learned. Many things that are, of course, in our common sense understanding, this we learn simply by interaction with the world. Nobody writes exactly down how you switch on the light when you come into a room and where you know the, the, the switch, the light switch usually is located or how to open the door that you have to push or to pull and that there is a level that you have to press or whatever. So these things are often not written down somewhere in a document and therefore of course these kind of language models that only train on data that is out there and that they can read, they will be dumb in the sense of common understanding. They would have, let's say, to monitor, to see the world and to experience the world, also to get more understanding of these common sense things. However, it remains unclear how much meaning, again, can be learned, in double quotes, via pure statistical models. So. One solution would be that symbolic AI, which means symbolic knowledge representation, like knowledge graphs, might come to the rescue. Let's have a look again here at deep learning alone. So we can't get to true AI um, that we can trust by relying on deep learning alone. So this is what we have learned so far. It's really good for some learning tasks, but it's usually bad for really doing good abstractions. On the other hand, classical AI, which means symbolic AI, will also not get us to robust AI because, yeah, scalability issues and stuff like that. Classical AI, symbolic AI, is very good in abstraction but poor for learning and this means, of course, both worlds have to get together somehow. We have to build hybrid AI models that are capable of, you know, making use of the advantages of both sides, of symbolic AI as well as of sub-symbolic AI. And there we are at hybrid AI and there, of course, using one for the benefit of the other is our prerogative. For example, we have already learned about knowledge graph embeddings, which are a deep learning based means or you know, tool that is based on symbolic knowledge representation, like on the knowledge graphs. We can use, of course, also then deep learning for knowledge extraction to create, again, symbolic uh, knowledge representations. We can use knowledge graphs to create explainable AI components or for fact-checking. So let's have a look at a these few examples. Knowledge graph embeddings, for example, as we have seen, they can be used for interesting tasks like knowledge graph completion. We can predict missing links. We can, for example, detect errors and we can then complement again these errors and can improve facts there. Knowledge graph embeddings can likewise be used for any kind of classification tasks. You can use them, for example, also to map one ontology to another ontology, simply to find out where are the structural similarities. And you can use it for entity or knowledge graph alignments across multiple knowledge graphs. We haven't covered this in the lecture, but this is also subject of current research. Let's have a look at knowledge extraction. Knowledge extraction, what you do there, you try to extract then symbolic knowledge representations from unstructured data of any kind. And usually you have some deep learning based knowledge extraction methods that are then able to do, for example, knowledge graph population, ontology learning, entity recognition and entity linking, or for example, also relation extraction. 
Going to explainable AI, this is then even more interesting for our domain. So we have here a foundation model. You have a prompt, you get the answer. And of course, the answer is not further explained by the AI model. You could simply see how the answer somehow fits into an explicit knowledge representation you have here in a knowledge graph. And simply by discovering the paths that is connecting the loose ends of the answers and the entities connected here in the answer, you could find out about explanations why this answer has been created, for example, also by the foundation model. So this would probably be something like path discovery in a knowledge graph, which can, is able to generate some kind of an explanation. Likewise, you can do fact checking. Again, the foundation model you know, is producing some kind of assertions which might be mapped to a knowledge graph and thereby path discovery, inconsistency detection and constraint validation. You could find out what is true and what is not true to really say, okay, which assertions that the foundation model made are correct or not correct. In theory, this sounds pretty convincing. However, in practice, Sometimes, of course, or most times, you also have to involve human intelligence, which is then the other kind of hybrid AI. Because, you know, domain knowledge might be represented in a knowledge graph, but already with common sense knowledge, we have difficulties because we have also to explicitly represent it in a knowledge graph. And likewise, for written literature, this is also not present in a knowledge graph. So we need world knowledge. We need experience, best practices. We need tacit knowledge, knowledge that nobody is speaking about. We need to know what comes before and after things. This is so-called a priori and a posteriori knowledge. We have to know also what we don't know. So we have to know about the known as well about the unknown unknown. And we need metadon knowledge, which means how to deal with knowledge and also situated knowledge, context-based knowledge. So there are many different kinds of knowledge that would have to be represented in a knowledge graph to do really true um, fact checking here in a general setting. So in a general setting, this is really, really difficult because exactly these sources of explicit knowledge might be missing. However, let's say in a closed domain where you do factual questions, they could be explained and checked, of course, then also in this domain-based knowledge graph reflecting exactly to the domain we were asking for. So that would be possible. So as said, a general use case potentially requires all kind of knowledge to be explicitly available. That would be one of the bottlenecks. And another bottleneck, of course, whenever you're dealing with symbolic knowledge representation, reasoning is another potential bottleneck. So what you could do there is you could probably not aim for a perfect justification. You could try to check and whenever there is doubt or doubt occurs, you could tell, you know, because this is faster. If there is some shadow of a doubt already, uh, it's, it's easier to, to, to stop as soon as you have reached a doubt than to check everything to get a full confirmation or justification. And also by that, the order in which you are, you know, checking then nodes and paths within your knowledge graph is of importance. So therefore, knowledge should always be organized in a hierarchical way, in a thematic content dependent way. So you would have modules. So to enable efficient access to exactly these knowledge graphs. And on the other hand, also the other solution then would be also include sometimes human intelligence with machine intelligence, especially if it comes to checking provenance and trust. Who said what? Whom can I trust? Of course, this is something what I have to find out. And this, of course, is also easier done by a human than by a machine. With these words, let me close and let me lead you to the final parts of our lecture, which are, again, knowledge graph based applications. And the last things we want to look in this lecture is a semantic search and b exploratory search.